Shalom Chavim. Uh, greetings, my friends. Peace be with you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the book of Ezra. And more specifically, I want to direct this to the leaders of Israel. It's, it's a fascinating book. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the book of Ezra, this is where Ezra is um, speaking of the events that are happening in Israel. The captivity of, of, of the Jews have been released by starting with Cyrus and Darius uh, and then later by Artaxerxes to go back home to rebuild the temple. The, the 70 years had ended and the Jews were able to return home. Interesting enough, we find that Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets uh, Haggai and Zechariah, are prophesying to the Jews in Jerusalem during this time. And, um, and another interesting fact is, is I really believe that it is a prophetic book. Uh, it very much, to me, foreshadows the exile that uh, our people have been in for the last 2,000 years and how that we do return again. And, of course, the building of the third temple is now becoming a very prominent issue and this is the reason why I wanted to bring up this video today, especially for the leaders of our country, the country of Israel. Um, it's a good warning also for Americans as well, and American politicians and in, in the, in the decisions they make concerning Israel. But it's more directed towards our own people, and especially amongst the rabbis uh, as well. It is a warning that we should be taking and considering very diligently uh, when I go to read to you some of the words and kind of get you to understand a little better here. Now, before I do that, let me just mention one thing to kind of set the stage for this. In chapter 6, we find that it says here, The king Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the, in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. Now, most Jewish brothers and sisters, you would probably not, probably not know that in the book of Revelation, when it talks about mystery Babylon, that's the Christian Bible, the last book of their Bible, um, mystery Babylon is the Vatican. It is Rome. And we know from Daniel, the prophet, uh, when the archangel Michael said that the prince that shall come would be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Now, we know Titus came and destroyed the temple and the sanctuary as far as the second temple, and he hauled back many of the artifacts, with the exception of the Ark of the Covenant, because it was hidden before that period. Um, but he hauled back, we see it on the Ark of Titus, it is in Rome, and, and it gives a beautiful, uh, it's not a beautiful thing to me, but they still make this beautiful monument, um, in which it depicts uh, them coming back with the treasures from the temple, including the menorah, and they're hidden in Babylon. Uh, spiritual Babylon in this case here, not a literal Babylon, but spiritual Babylon. And so therefore, Michael speaks of how that the prince that shall come will be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. So this prince that, that we as Jews expect to come has to be from Rome again. Now, consequently, I kind of find it ironic as well, because when um, when Jesus of Nazareth, the, the uh, Messiah for the Christian people, was on earth, right before our temple was destroyed, was destroyed 70 years after uh, his crucifixion, we find that um, the Romans were in control of Jerusalem then. Now, this is why I'm bringing this up to the leaders of Israel now, because Rome is pushing to gain control of Israel once again. And our, our leaders are failing to recognize that the prince that shall come is trying to gain control of our country once again. And it's a serious, serious matter. And not just with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, our, 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 our anointed king, if, you would say, if we would call him that, uh, Mike Evans, uh, who was the man that anointed him uh, before his pol political career began, and his political career began happened, happened to begin at the, right at the, after the moment of him being anointed, which was kind of ironic in itself. But let me just kind of share with you, though, something here in the book of Ezra that will kind of help my brethren and, and, and the leaders of our country to realize the, the mistakes they're making. Now, when Ezra is speaking of, of, of um, through the book here, he's, he's, they're trying to get the temple rebuilt. They're trying, he's pushing to get these things done, the right things there, the money there. The kings are backing it financially. 
They've opened up the treasury. Artaxerxes, who happen to believe, uh, happens to be a very interesting character in himself. I know that there are some scholars that believe that he was the possible uh, son or grandson of uh, Esther, and I believe that could be very well true because he chose Nehemiah to be his cupbearer, which would be kind of ironic for a Gentile king to choose a Jew for a cupbearer. Um, but I kind of feel like that he kind of types uh, Moshiach ben David, in fact. And in fact, if we were to look at Jesus as possibly being a candidate for Moshiach, how would he type him? Well, what's interesting, he's called King of Kings. And I know that Jesus uh, is referred to, I think in the book of Revelation, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And secondly, uh, when, when Nehemiah makes requests to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and the streets to put protection so the temple could be restored, uh, he is actually, it's, he records in there that the queen is sitting with him which kind of makes it look like to me that the Christians, they have a, a, a belief of a rapture where the, the, the Christian, uh, they call it the Christian church. I believe it's a, just a selected few that would be taken up uh, and, and go to be with uh, Jesus if he truly is Mashiach. Now, and of course the gospel then turns back to the Jews. In other words, our, the seven years that Daniel spoke of, uh, we now begin to have that opportunity to uh, have Moshiach come to us. And as Rabbi uh, Meister often says, is this your first time or your second time? Uh, interesting comment that he makes there. Uh, but here's what I want to bring out here. When Ezra begins to uh, work on the, on the reconstruction efforts that uh, have been put forth, um, there comes word to him, and this is the word that is said in chapter 9, When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites. Now, notice he says, with respect to the abomination of the Canaanites. It's, it's not the fact that you cannot... Uh, have commerce or so forth, but it's the abominations. Now watch what he says here carefully here. The Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with peoples of these lands. Indeed, the land of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garments and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting and having torn my garments and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to, to the heavens. Now let me just stop for a moment and bring in the, the impact behind this so you can follow why I'm reading this to the leaders of our country, to the, to the chief rabbi of Israel, to Benjamin Netanyahu, to many others uh, there, Gershon Solomon, a very dear friend of mine. God does not want us to marry in with the Vatican. The Vatican is not the source of Christianity. I've heard many rabbis take their arguments that they have with Christianity and they go, to the, they go to the Pope and this is supposed to be the authority of Christianity. God calls them in the book of Revelation the great whore. She is a harlot. She is untrue to her marriage vow, which means she doesn't keep the word of God. Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, he once made the comment in a debate that he had with a Christian that the Christians that followed the teacher Jesus were far better than the Christians today. He's right. They are. And they were. And sadly enough, though, my brother, we're having a similar problem amongst our own leaders of our own nation. 
Just as Ezra brings out here, the word comes to him that the leaders were the, were the foremost in this. They had married the daughters of the other nations. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, being Jewish, uh, the writings of the Christian Bible, but do you good to read it? Because it speaks of the churches that come off of, uh, of that great whore. It said that she had daughters. And oftentimes, there are scholars that are referred to that as the systems. Now, not the people, not the Christian people. There are genuine Christian people out there. But the systems out there have spun off of what the Vatican has done. And if the Vatican is, is referred to as a harlot in the book of Revelation, why then do we look to them as an authority of what Christianity is? No wonder Hashem has to send two witnesses. You know why? Because these two witnesses can't come out of any of these Christian denominations. You know, I made a comment not long ago, and a dear sister sent me a message on YouTube, and she'll probably watch this video as well. And because I made a comment that, that Christianity was to provoke the Jews to jealousy, because the Word of God says that. And she says the comment back, uh, it's kind of a sad because we're not doing a very good job at it. And she's right. And interesting enough, when that sister gave that comment to me, it made me realize something. It's not the churches of today that provoke Jews to jealousy. If anything, it causes confusion. But what will provoke the Jews to jealousy? There must be a revival amongst the Christian people that has not happened as of yet that will stir around the world. And if truly there is to be a rapture of the bride, then there must be a revival amongst that bride that will cause the Jews to take notice. That's what will provoke Israel to jealousy. Not the nonsense that Israel is seeing right now. We look around at Christianity and it's a joke. No wonder why Rabbi Yosef makes the comments that he does. Because truly Christianity has become a joke to us. Not, not the heart of it. As Rabbi Yosef even points out, the early Christians that followed Jesus were far better than they are today. And it's true. But my brethren, you need to wake up as well. My Jewish brethren, you need to wake up because Ezra left us uh, what was happening in the days of the rebuilding of the second temple and it's foreshadowing what's happening today. Benjamin Netanyahu, Shimon Perez is the one that kind of kicked this off, working a, 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 this covenant with the Vatican, giving up certain things for the Vatican, uh, certain holy sites to take control of in order to, 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 uh, to bring peace, to bring a second state, uh, or not a second state, but to make a Palestinian state. That's an abomination to God. And yet we're going to marry her up? The Vatican's going to meet in Israel in December here, or uh, they're going to come to Israel. The Pope and them are going to meet with, with the leaders of Israel. And, and, the, and the whole issue is to coming down that Israel wants to build the third temple. And this goes to with my brother... Um, Oh gosh, God forgive me right now. I know his name and my mind's just blank right now. The, the head of the Temple Institute, the rabbi there. My brother, do not, do not link yourself up with that Vatican. Do not make any concessions just to get the temple artifacts back. I said to my good friend Gershon Solomon as well. I saw the letter. He showed it to me personally when I was living in Israel. He showed me the letter that he sent to the Pope, Pope John Paul II, uh, I believe, at the time, demanding the temple artifacts back. That's the way you do it. You don't go ask and make a covenant. Don't marry her. You know, and not just the Vatican. It's the same thing. It was He talks about that they had married the daughters of the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Ammonites. Making peace in the name of peace. Give up more land. Give up more land. God is not happy with none of this. In fact, Ezra, he took and he, and, he, and he tore his clothes and he began to weep and wail. What has happened among our people? Make the covenant with Egypt. Make a covenant with, with Syria. Make a covenant with, with Iran. Make a covenant with nonsense. You know, I remember um, one of the, the chief rabbi of Israel one time when Benjamin Netanyahu at first took into politics 
and he's standing there with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he says, what have you done to help to bring Moshiach, Ben David, back? What have you, or, or to bring him? And the thing was, was, you know, nothing had been done as of yet. You know, he wanted to know what had been done. And, and Benjamin says, he says, I'm, we're trying. He says, well, you're not trying enough. You know, stand for the word of God. Stand for Torah. And God will bless our people. We don't have to bow down. We don't have to be cowards. We don't have to marry the Catholic Church. We don't have to marry the Baptist, the Methodist, or the Presbyterian, or none of the rest of them. We don't have to have covenants with them. Now, it doesn't mean, if you notice, that's why I brought out that little point right there. He said, uh, 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 let me read here again. The Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites. It doesn't mean that you cannot be a friend or be friendly. But the abomination to begin with is the fact that the Dome of the Rock stands on the Temple Mount. And, and you know, Rabbi... Uh, Yosef Mitzrahi, he makes a comment that the only prophecy that Jesus ever made was that Israel would not return. That's nonsense. Nonsense. No place. The Christian Bible clearly shows that Israel will return. Paul in the book of Romans, Jesus as well, when he stands and he weeps over Jerusalem, he said, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house is left desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He's not talking of the nation of Israel and he's not talking of the physical temple. He is speaking specifically of your own heart, your own soul. It's left desolate without the Spirit of God. And that's something we will get into. We are going to get into that, my brother. I'm going to show you like when you ask that one uh, minister or maybe he's not a minister but from the college area and you ask him, you know, that one of your first questions to him was uh, 25 mistakes in the Christian Bible because Matthew gives a, a report of, um, of one genealogy and Luke gives a report of a different genealogy, different names altogether. And then, of course, you're smart enough to know that the Vatican says, well, uh, one gives uh, the genealogy of Mary. Well, why doesn't it say the daughter of so-and-so? You know, but let me tell you something. We're going to get into that, but I will tell you, it's not a mistake. And yes, one does come through, the, through Mary's lineage as well. And it's not uncommon for a father-in-law to be called a father, especially in a case like this here. And the reason why the genealogies are different is because Solomon, through his sons that were coming down, God placed a curse. And secondly, through... Through David, being the son of David, even, even, look at the scripture when it comes out there and he says, when, when Jesus asks, why does David then in the, in the spirit say, he says to, to, speaking of the son of David, Moshiach, he calls him Lord. Why would he call his son Lord? The genealogy, they have to bring it down through Mary's side. And the reason why they do is because that is, the, that is the kinsman redeemer side. And yes, she is a daughter of David. But it takes it back to her fathers. Not through the mothers. And as far as Joseph, you know, we, we, let's save it. We'll save that debate. I want to really take my time and go into all the questions that Rabbi Yosef puts. Because he says we're seeking for truth. And yes, we are. But right now, let me go back to this part about Ezra. There, there's another uh, let me just share with you a little bit more because my brethren, this is very serious for, the, for, for our people to know. Let's read on down. And now in, the, in, in a little while, grace has been shown. We're in verse 8, chapter 9. Uh, to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place. A little spot. And it was a remnant. See, a little remnant has come back. The captives of Israel. To plunder and to humiliation is to this day. And now for a little while grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us measure of revival in our bondage. Do you I mean, a revival, an enlightenment. There should be a revelation that's supposed to happen. 
just as it was in, but there's supposed to be a revelation in today. This is only foreshadowing the return of our people today. My gosh, my brethren. Well, let's read on down a little bit more. And now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanliness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. And now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the, uh, the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. Don't get tied up with churches and, and, and the Muslims and stuff like that and make a bunch of covenants. You give up land. You know, I realize that God will bring the kingdom of God will come down and there'll be peace on earth. I realize that. Moshiach is to bring that. I know that. But you know what? It's going to come when there's a change in our heart, when there's a revival, when we separate ourselves. We don't have to make covenants. We don't have to give up land. God has brought us back there for a purpose. Now let me read on a little bit more there. Verse 11, which you commanded by your servants to prophesy. saying, okay, we just read that one in verse 12. Now therefore do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong. I think we read that as well. Verse 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since your own God have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us? so that there would be no remnant or survivor. O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though none, no one can stand before you because of this. Let's read a little more, brethren. Chapter 10. Now while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping, bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men and women and children gathered to him from Israel for the people wept very bitterly. Think of the words of prophet Zechariah had to say to our people. There will come a time they'll look upon him whom they have pierced and they will weep and mourn as a family that lost their only son. A large group. What about the 144,000 that John who was a Jewish brother of ours that wrote there'd be 144,000, a large assembly. My God, my God. Mm. Weeping bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of uh, Yehiel. That's interesting, Shechaniah. From the name the Shekinah of God. That's what we have need of. The Shekinah glory to dwell in our hearts. That's the temple that God intends to build. And I'm not against the building of the third temple, neither, my brother, but I'm not for offering a sacrifice. All we have need of is to recognize that God gave us a sacrifice for our sins. And if we would accept that sacrifice, then His Spirit, His life could come inside of us and we could be one with Hashem as it was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's what we have need of, my brethren. Shechaniah, the son of Yahweh, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and those who have trembled at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise for this matter is your responsibility. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leaders uh, of the priests of the Levites and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to his word. So they uh, swore an oath. Then Ezra rose up from being before the house of, uh, uh, the house of God and went in the chamber of uh, 
Jehanan, the son of Elias, Elias of it. When they came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. And they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the descendants of the captivity that they must gather at Jerusalem. My brethren, we need to return back to the homeland, back to Jerusalem. I want you to think back to the days. I, you need to really think back now. Think back to the prophet there that said that in the third day we'd be gathered again and we'd have life in his sight. They issued a proclamation throughout all Judah and Jerusalem to the descendants of the captivity that they must again return to Jerusalem and whosoever would not come within three days according to the instruction of the leaders and elders, all his property would be confiscated and he himself would be separated from the assembly of those from the captivity. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month. Benjamin is a type of the remnant of Israel that would return in this day. And do we not have three days later, nearly 3,000 years has passed and our people have once again gathered again to the homeland. And we're back now in our homeland to receive Mashiach ben David. I urge you, the United States is not where we should be. Rabbi Winston says exile is not an option. And it's not an option. We need redemption. We need gula. And Jesus is the only way. He is our Moshiach. You know what? It doesn't matter if our people can see it or get it at this point. Because he will come and prove he is Moshiach. Rabbi Mizrahi. You made a beautiful statement and I couldn't agree more. If Eliyahu Navi were to come in our midst, we don't want to hear him say, I'm Eliyahu, I'm Elijah, because the word of God has said, I'm Elijah. We don't care about that. We will say, prove it that you're Elijah. And that's true. You're right, my brother. It's the same thing with Moshiach. We can say it, he's coming. We can say Eliyahu is coming. I could even say Moshe is coming. And we have scripture for this. There are some of our rabbis that believe that uh, Moshe will return and he will be Moshiach. We have all kinds of ideas. But as Gershon Solomon once said to me, we have all kinds of conceptions of how Moshiach should come. But if he chooses to come a different way, it's okay. Because we always seem to be wrong in our ideas of what we think. Let's just be ready, my brethren. Let's search the word. Let's begin to question. Let's look at these things. Forget, forget all the ideas of the denominational beliefs. It's not to say that there's not good Christian people there. I believe there are. I've met many of them. Many denominations. Many good Christian people. But it doesn't provoke us to jealousy. And, and this for my Christian brothers and sisters. The only thing that's going to provoke us to jealousy will be a revival that will happen amongst the bride that is to come. She, there must be a bride. I called out people from every one of these groups. And there's something that I believe that Jesus, when he gathers his bride together, it'll cause such a stir that we'll recognize that. That will drive us to jealousy. And that is when Moshiach will visit us. Baruch Hashem.